Floyd story has been the story of black folks because ever since 401 years ago the reason we could never be who we wanted and dreamed to be in is you kept your knee on our neck we were smarter than the underfunded schools you put us in, but you had your knee on our neck. Things needed to change. Everything was color this and color that, and we didn't. We were kids. We didn't really know exactly what was going on, but we were willing to try. That was the year they were going to integrate, and nobody wanted to go. And all I'm thinking, I said, now we've been fighting for this you know, all of this time, and now here it comes, it's staring us in the face, and everybody is tricking it out. I said, somebody need to represent, you know, after all of this struggling and fighting, and you won't equal this and equal that, but nobody wants to pay the price. Nobody wanted to say, okay, I'll go. And I was one of the nuts that said, I'll go. The 1960s was a turbulent period in the country, especially in the South. Mississippi, with its deep-rooted history of racism, segregation, and violence, was a state that aggressively opposed the fight for social justice and equality during the Civil Rights Movement. There weren't a lot of stores that blacks were allowed to go to. Woolworth come to mind where they had an eating counter, a lunch counter. You couldn't eat at that counter if you were black. It was very, very segregated. Blacks were riding on the back of the bus. As far as riding the bus, you come accustomed to dropping your money in, walking to the back. So that was printed in our heads. 1961, the Freedom Riders came to town. There were lots of arrests, lots of violence uh, occurred. James Meredith uh, entered Ole Miss and two people were killed in the rioting that occurred when he uh, was enrolled as the first black student at the University of Mississippi. And then in 1963, Medgar Evers, who was the field secretary for the NAACP, was murdered. When the United States Supreme Court um, declared in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 that separate but equal had no place, in terms of public education. It required a year later in the Brown II decision for desegregation to be implemented infamously with all deliberate speed. Right here today, I don't go to the Jackson Park because I can remember going to that park and not tired, not being able to sit down, not being able to drink water from that fountain. I won't go to that park today. There were shops you could go in, you couldn't try on clothes, you couldn't try on hats. Um, it was very segregated. You had colored water fountains. You had colored restrooms, if there were restrooms downtown that you could use at all. You know, you just did what, what you had to do and, and you didn't, didn't worry about nobody else. You know, we, we, had a, we had a pretty good understanding. You know, the blacks stayed with the blacks and the whites stayed with the whites and we didn't, didn't have no problem. Well, during the 60s, that was a, a very interesting year for the whole country, but especially in the South, because desegregation was a the big issue. And I was a part of the desegregation in our state of Mississippi. We integrated parks, we integrated uh, schools, and I was a part of all those these efforts. I was arrested, and I stayed in jail for five days during one period. It was just an interesting period. The next period of time that was the big change was when I was teaching at Provine. And that was when um, the program called Freedom of Choice was implemented. The idea was pretty simple. Within a school district, a parent was going to be free to choose where they sent their uh, children to school. Sounds great. 
doesn't say anything about race, doesn't say anything about segregation, you're free to choose what school you send your child to. So if you live in a school district where the formerly all white schools had the best facilities, the best resources, more books in the library, the best athletic facilities, everything that you can imagine, better pay for teachers, right? You could choose as a black parent to send your child there. When they said that was the year they were going to integrate and nobody wanted to go. And all I'm thinking, I said, now we've been fighting for this all of this time and now here it comes, it's staring us in the face and everybody is tricking it out. I said, somebody need to represent. They just would talk to the young uh, teenagers who were in public school, asking them, would you volunteer to integrate the schools? They understood that these black parents would not make that choice because of the danger it put their children in. And there were very real repercussions for parents who attempted, through freedom of choice, to desegregate formerly all white schools. Their children faced violence and intimidation in the school. They faced resegregation in schools. Um, in a classroom, black children might have their own places to sit in the classroom. They had their own table in the lunchroom. They had their own table in the library. Parents might face violence and intimidation. There's a story that a local activist here in Jackson named Rums Barber tells about the day he helped a woman enroll her children in a formerly all-white school in Ridgeland, Mississippi. And that night the Klan was burning a cross in her front yard. I do remember vividly that one night uh, a, cross was, a cross was burnt in front of our house. And uh, now my, to go back a little bit, my father was, uh, came from a large family. There were nine boys and two girls. So that, the incident that night, uh, my father called his brothers. And uh, I remember very vividly that they were all pretty much stationed, stationed at different areas of our house, uh, waiting for any, you know, return. Despite all of that, there were still a few black parents who did, who chose to send their children to the all-white school, which in turn helped the segregationist argument, well, there are now two black children who go to this school. It is desegregated. We did our job. And so as far as a segregationist strategy goes, it's really effective because it thwarts the vast majority of any black interest in desegregating a public school. And at the same time, it allows for just a token amount of desegregation. The NAACP asked me and several other students to uh, uh, integrate a Provine, and I was one of those seven, 11. When I was younger, like a kid, and what I learned in school about the Civil Rights Movement, and I remember seeing like the images of like the boycotts and the riots and the protesting, and it's just, it's kind of insane that they actually lived through that moment. And they were treated so bad just because of the color of their skin. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 threatened to cut off federal funding for school districts that failed to create a plan to integrate their schools. As a result, freedom of choice desegregation plans were developed. These plans allowed students to choose what school they wanted to attend. Well, of course, I remember uh, the whole topic of desegregation, integration, um, because it was very hard to get away from it. Uh, while I was still at Provine, uh, Brown versus Board had already happened, and uh, we were um, knowledgeable and aware that there were a lot of efforts to prevent the schools from being desegregated, or at least to prevent black students from coming to white schools, all white schools. The NAACP encouraged us to uh, uh, integrate the schools. It was a choice. We were not forced to integrate, but first one to do it on our own. Talking with them and deciding that we needed some changes in Mississippi. So rather than just sitting back and just continue to wait in, we just got together and decided that uh, it's time for us to do something. We did know each other, but no, we were not like a group or a clique or anything at, our, at Jim Hill, our old school. We did get a lot of comments from staff and students alike 
that said, that asked us, how were we chosen? And we were none of, as far as I know, none of us were chosen. And in fact, a lot of us were discouraged from going because of the accomplishments we had at our black school at Jim Hill. They asked us individually, and since I was already active in the in the uh, civil rights movement with the demonstrations and things, I was a, you know, a candidate. When it was announced that Provine would be integrated, then it became a concern for a lot of people. And so it was the talk of the campus. But probably not a big issue for most of the kids. It was a large school. There were large classes. Most of us had concerns that we had to deal with every day, you know, and integration was not one of them. You know, so I would say that probably the average student heard, heard all the talk, but they just went about their business, you know. One of the major goals of the civil rights movement was to desegregate public schools across the United States. In 1965, 11 African-American students decided to transfer to the all-white Provine High School their senior year. It was a matter of my mom and I used to walk past Provine High School uh, on our way to Western Plaza to the Jitney Jungle. And I used to joke all the time with my mom. I said, you know what, one day I'm going to graduate from that school. And we would both laugh when the opportunity came up. My mom marched me up the steps first. So I was the first one that it was more like her dream come true, but probably like a prophetic moment for me because I had always said since I was a little girl that I wanted to go there, not really ever thinking I would, but that's how I ended up there. Back in probably 1965 or 66, Mars senior year, he decided that uh, he was always a big civil rights activist. And he decided that something need to, needed to be done about the school system. And he and a group of others got together and decided they would probably be, well, would be the first to integrate uh, uh, one of the local Jackson Public Schools, which was Provine. So I said, Mom, Dad, uh, I want to go to Provine. What you going over there for, boy? <laughs> so I convinced my dad he was one of them yasa men. I don't care how old the white boy was, he would always say yasa, yasa. And well, my mother went and signed. My dad put me in the car and went over and signed for me. And I was surprised. So I said, if Hazel going, I'm going. <laughs> and of course, Candy stepped up and said, sure, i do it. And he did, and my grandmother was very um, concerned about that because she, she felt that it would be um, some anxieties and, and fights and, and she didn't want him involved in that. But she pretty much let him decide to do what he wanted to do. I thought about transferring from Jim Hill a long time and the reason I did that was I just didn't think things were right for, for us not to go to that school. And I just, I didn't want to be the only one to go. I had a good friend of mine, Dan Williams, and he, if you look at him today, he looks white. And you couldn't tell, tell him from a white person. And I tried to get him to go, but he wouldn't go. So. I don't know if I talked with Vernon or Hazel them anyway before I decided to go, but I just decided on my own that I would go and see. And it was really an experience that I'll never forget. I just felt, like I said, I really felt bad that at the time when after we were, everybody's fighting for integration and, you know, we, we need to integrate, we need to integrate, we need, and when it shows up, nobody. I said it would make us look really bad that nobody wants to do it now. Nobody wants to pay the price 
to be the first because I think with, they had started before at the elementary school, but for as far as high school, the 12th grade, they started off with them. So it was like, okay, now what? It would be to me, okay, we offered it to them. Now look, nobody showed up, you know, and I felt bad. I felt bad on that. There was only 11 of us blacks in the whole school and that created a big problem. Despite the possible danger they could face, the 11 black students showed up to Provine on the first day of school in the fall of 1965. Oh yes, that first day it was a line of uh, Caucasians uh, shouting names and very, very ugly toward us. We had that experience really throughout the year. But the first day well, there were a number of people that were screaming and yelling and, and, and using the N-word. And We all walked into a uh, program with our parents with us. Uh, they were yelling, people yelling at us as we walked up the aisle and through the, up, up the sidewalks. And we went into the office of the, I believe the principal. And from there we were sent to our rooms, our classrooms. First day at Provine to me was very scary, but exciting. Um, I remember my mom walking me up the steps and to the principal's office, because that's where we had to report. Uh, to get our class assignments and that's pretty much all I remember about that day just my mom telling me I can do this and just took me by the hand and walked me up the steps into the building. I'm trying to remember where they're at the police escort but I remember them coming in you know to lead us in and all of the the, the white families out there cussing and fussing and don't and, and nigga this and nigga that it just got to be like I tell them okay whatever. Charles Harper He's a good friend of ours around here. I think he might have took me to school out there. My parents or nothing never went out there at all. And I'm trying to think, I can't remember how the first day of class went, but it wasn't very good at all. You know, none of the students want you there. And, and we all would wait together out front together to walk in because they were like standing up at the entrance way and didn't want you to come through like, you know, and. So we all would wait to, for each other and go out there. In fact, that we never, never drove a car out there at all because we just figured it might be damaged or something. My experience with that is all of a sudden she was going to Provine and my mother uh, was taking the students to school in the morning. I was still going to Isabel, so I was in the car and she would pick them up after school. And uh, after school, uh, the white students would uh, be taunting and uh, trying to start something. My first day at Provine, about the only thing I can remember is sitting in my English class. All the white kids was against, you walk in the door. All the white kids was in the rows at the door. And you skip about two rows, and here I was sitting by the window. And all I can remember then is if someone had shot up in here, they would get me. And that's, that's the only thing. When you walk into the school and you come in, the office is to your right, where there's a long hallway. Our school lockers were, was close to that part because it was close to the office, which means the counselors and, you know, and stuff. Instead of being down the hall, they wanted all of us together in case anything jumped off. Our lockers were in the front of the building. There was a set of stairs at the front when you're going up, but there was also a set of stairs way down. Well, if you had a class way down, the other stairs were so narrow, they didn't want you going down that, so they want you to walk all the way down the hall, to go down these big steps, to walk all the way back down the hall. I said, this really, you know, after a while, that got tiring. The 11 students were constantly harassed by their white classmates throughout their senior year. They dealt with bullying, name calling, and sometimes even fights. 
However, some of the black students let it be known they weren't going to run off easily, and although outnumbered, they stood their ground and fought back. While they were there, the um, white students treated them really bad. Very bad attitude from the teachers on down, from our principal. They just treated them very inferior. When they announced integration at Provine, I didn't have a dog in the race. I just had too many other things to worry about. And then when the kids got there, it didn't worry me then. You had kids that stirred the pot and tried to make it into a, a big deal and tried to do what they could to discourage the black kids that were there. Some were, other white kids were more aggressive towards us than others. Some, the rest of them, uh, some of them just laid back and laughed. But uh, you had a few that really stood out. I think Joanne was in the gym class because she was very timid and they would be messing with her and they would line you up alphabetical and she was Robinson and I was Crosley. So, you know, she's at the back of the line and, and they were, no, you're not going to bully her. No, we ain't, we, no, we're not going down like this. And sometimes they would bully, like changing classes and, and you would come to the locker and she's crying and what's the girl, look, you can't, we, you ain't going to make it like this. Just about every day, if you're going up the stairwell and they're coming down, they would spit on top of your head. So they did stuff like that practically every day. Every day when he'd get ready to go and change back into his school clothes, when he'd go to his locker, his school clothes were torn, cut up. Uh, he wore glasses, glasses smashed and on the floor, no lens on them. And he would have to call my grandmother, you know, to ask her to bring him some clothes. Roland and I went to, it was a McDonald's down on 80 Highway. And we went in there and, and he had a little 22 pistol. And when we was going into the store, into the restaurant there, he slid me the pistol that I had it in my hand. And, and we got in there, it was about four or five white guys together, young kids like we were. And they followed us outside and they was ready to fight us. And when one turned, I had the gun in my hand and I just slapped him upside the head with the gun and the gun went off. And, and I didn't know if I had shot him or not, but we left there, but we never heard nothing about nobody being shot or nothing, so. You know, have you just seen a smart, quiet kid? The, the boy never said anything. One day, they talked him into calling me a black bitch. I'm the only little black child in English. I walk in, walk past him, and he looked and he said, you black bitch. I said, I know he didn't do that. I turned around, I slapped that boy so hard. Glasses went one way, he went, to, if it had been anybody else, it wouldn't have bothered me because I was used to it. This is the studious one that never said anything bad or anything. And you call me a what? I tell him, oh no, not today. The incident uh, in the uh, restroom, I was uh, pushing the door to go in and apparently he knew I was coming in and he, he pushed the door back on me and I just gave him one hard shove and pushed him all the way against the wall. And he left me alone. So they really, pretty much, they had a name for me around the school. They said, don't mess with him. That's that big black bad nigga there. So they pretty much stayed away from me. I wasn't that bad, but when I was at Jim Hill, Pro, uh, Brinkley, I was a pretty mild student. You know, I didn't say anything to anyone. But when I got at Provine, it just, some rage just, I got something just built up in me where I wouldn't, take anything from nobody. White boys at one time brought a monkey from the zoo to the school and had permission to do it. And that, well, the teachers turned their back on it. A man named Morris Lewis, he was a student, a uh, black student from Jim Hill, along with my sister. So they said, Morris, here's your brother. Morris said, oh, let me see that monkey, boy. He said, give me that monkey. Because Morris had no fear of that. 
So he took the monkey and he pulled the monkey's skin back, his, his hair back. He said, look at that skin, that's light. It, that, I'm brown skin. He said, that's, that, 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 that's y'all. He said, look at that hair, my hair curly. That's why, that's, that's long straight hair. Look more like your brother than mine. Pass it back to him. So for about two months, they left him alone. So they realized there, there was no fear. After the black kids got there and started going to class and going to gym and going to the pep rallies and just life at high school, um, you noticed that uh, kids treated them different. It was kind of repetitive thing. They were name calling some, trying to put a little tack in your seat so they to look at your seat when you sit down. The thing that I do recall and the thing that stands out in my mind is not bullying scenes, but just an absence of help or, uh, you know, or uh, camaraderie. Name calling, the, uh, when the holidays would come, there were shooting firecrackers, sometimes throwing fire, firecrackers at us. And some of the students got in a fight from, uh, with, the, with the, uh, our students. Uh, it was just a, you know, it was a, a culture change for them and also for us as, as, a, as a blacks. And uh, some tried to be friendly. And if they tried to be friendly, the, their peers would get angry with them. One incident I remember quite well, we were in the cafeteria and it seemed as if as one of the black students lunch was ending the other one was beginning so we never had opportunity to congregate together so as I was in line a white girl bumped into me and I'll never forget that day we had spaghetti and she had on a yellow dress and she bumped into me and instead of saying excuse me she said Ooh, a nigger. So I just dumped my spaghetti on her. The 11 students realized quickly that many of their teachers at Provine were just as opposed to them being there as their white classmates. My teachers uh, at Provine, they treated me like I wasn't there and I act like I wasn't there. So they, they didn't ask me nothing and I didn't uh, say anything to them. I heard colleagues and people that had been my teachers when I had been a student at Provine that I really admired as teachers and learned a lot from uh, and were mentors for me teaching in the teacher's lounge and aside in other circumstances uh, I heard them say terrible things about black students. They used the n-word, they used words like jigaboo and they used words like uh, I don't want any of those apes in my class. And it was just unbelievable to me. I personally had problems with the younger teachers. The older teachers I didn't really have a problem with, but the younger teachers, like in early 20s, I had problems with those. I think um, the teachers did not want us there. As far as my experience go personally, I did not have an instructor that recognized me in the classroom. If there was a question presented to the class, I raised my hand, it's like I wasn't there. Um, uh, a couple of my teachers had very, very hard Southern accents and I could barely understand what they were saying. Uh, I'll take, for instance, my Spanish class. I made 100 on every test and I still flunked the class. So we, they just made me feel like we didn't belong there. I remember we had one teacher that was a good teacher. Her name was Miss Coker. She was a teacher there. She was uh, blonde. She was the sweetest teacher, person. She was just a good person. She helped us out a lot. I don't know if any of the rest of them remember, but I remember her. Don Abba Gibson, I always keep that. I just admired him so much because he was like the smartest student at Jim Hill, period. He go to Provine. They did everything they could to flunk him. He was just too smart, they couldn't do it. But all the ones that they could manipulate in any kind of way, 
they did. And I think they failed us by category. They categorized us, they boxed us, they had us separated into light and dark, they had us separated into short and tall. Even though he had made the grades, he was not allowed to graduate. Um, and that's another time my grandmother went over there in his defense wanting to know why and they wanted to justify that by him getting into fights or um, issues with the basketball team. That was one of the reasons that he could not graduate from Provine. Candy ended up going to Brinkley High School in Jackson because it was the only black school that had summer session where he could still graduate in the year that he was supposed to. So um, my grandmother sent him over there and he graduated valedictorian of that summer class. After graduation from uh, Brinkley, he was very disappointed. Um, and that was the only time that he said he probably wished he had a state at Jim Hill. The teacher, she was like, uh, if you, she asked you, asked the class a question, if you raised your hand, she wasn't going to call on you. So, and then if you didn't raise your hand, she'll be the first one to call because she wanted to embarrass you in front of the rest of the class. So we kind of figured out that after a little while and if we didn't know the answer, we just, we raised our hand and then she wouldn't call on us. My chemistry teacher looked at me and told me, I don't care what you do, there is no way, I don't care how you study what you do, you will never pass chemistry. The upkeep of the school was better. Um, I did not learn anything my senior year. I was not taught anything my senior year. So I believe the level of education, the quality of education was much higher at Jim Hill than it was a profan. I got no education my senior year. What I mean is that the teachers did not teach me. Um, it was like I was not in the class. If a question was presented to the class, I raised my hand. I was not called on ever. Um, my, a lot of my papers that I turn in were ungraded and he go give them and give them back to me. So I don't believe I was taught that year at all. When I got ready to go to Provine, I, uh, I knew I was a D student. So I went there and took the easiest class possible. As the 11 students adapted to Provine, they found themselves excluded from many activities, organizations, and school events. They were also oftentimes separated from each other. Well, we had Roland Dotson, who transferred from Jim Hill, who was the star basketball player. Uh, we had several others uh, who had participated in other sports. Uh, I remember Melba Sue Chambliss was a major red at Jim Hill. We were told when we got there, you had to start ninth grade in any extracurricular activity. You had to start at ninth grade. And since we were seniors, we were not allowed to participate in anything. Like we couldn't go there after school. We couldn't do anything. The only thing we could do is, is when school was over, get, get away from over there. You know, we didn't go, we, in your senior year, you sort of missed out on everything. You didn't go to, uh, you didn't go to any of the activities. No football game, no basketball games. You couldn't, you, they couldn't chance you going to stuff like that because they don't know what's going to happen. We met at school, we met at school, we didn't, we didn't go to any of the activities, we didn't go to, you know, we didn't go to no football game, you know, that would have been dangerous, so we didn't go to, uh, you know, we didn't take part in any of that activities that I can remember outside the school. We took no, I don't remember taking part in any activities outside the school, because, you know, they, they didn't invite us and it probably been problems there. Uh, in my uh, yearbook. I think it says I was a member of the tennis club. I've never had a tennis racket in my hand. Uh, also, it also said my senior quote was step by step, the ladder is ascended. I didn't write that. <laughs> Let's put it like, I don't know who did. So I don't know about the other ones, but I know mine was injected by someone other than myself. Uh, several of the girls at some point wanted to, to quit. 
as far as we knew, they said there was not going to be a prom, a senior prom. We later found out after the fact that they actually had what they called a private party at the Jackson Country Club. So therefore, we were, none of us was invited in. And at that time, blacks could not attend the country club. So no, we did not have a senior prom at Provine. They would see the notices come out, all the flyers, but the black kids were not given a flyer. They knew that it was happening and when it was happening, but they were not invited. I don't remember nothing about a prom. I know I didn't go <laughs> at all. And I probably wouldn't have went if I was invited because I just didn't want to be around a bunch of people that didn't want me there. They ordered their rings their junior year. So what we did is we called the people that did the rings and asked them, could we place them, you know, how would we go about doing the ordering stuff? So when we went back to the school and asked them, oh, no, see, we did, uh, they got their rings for junior year, so you can't, they won't do rings for you now. But we had already been and got the information that they would, so they had to let us order rings. Then when they graduated, they had to have a public graduation. So what the white kids and teachers did, they told the white kids, girls, to wear white shoes, or patent leather shoes. Fine. But they told the black to wear black shoes. So when we came, no one told them not to wear that we didn't know. So Melba and, and the other girls came, they had black patent leather shoes on, it was too late to go and change. We were mostly just by ourselves in the classroom. It was in the school period because they kept us so separated from each other, the 11 of blacks. They kept us so separated till you really, really felt like you was on this battlefield by yourself. And I think that was the purpose for keeping us so separated, to make us understand that we didn't belong there um, over and over and over again. And this even touches on modern day. We would hear, go back where you came from, go back to wherever. You know, they didn't know that, I believe all of us came from Jim Hill and they didn't know the various schools or that we all came from Jim Hill, but go back where you came from, nigger, you don't believe, belong here, nigger. But I think they just kept us isolated because the feeling was if they saw two of us gathered together, there would be some reason to intervene in that conversation, like we were plotting or they wouldn't give us the opportunity to get together and try to create something not knowing that maybe we knew each other outside of school, you know, but it was always to keep us separate in school. I remember Jackie from, from our junior year in high school, but at Provine, I don't think I ever seen her. I have no classes with her. And it seemed like they was trying to keep us all separate, you know, they didn't want like two of us like in the same class or nothing. It was mandatory that all graduating seniors attend the senior play called John Brown's Body. The play told the story of the American abolitionist John Brown, a man who became a martyr through his attempt to end slavery. The senior play, John Brown's Body Lies Molding in the Grave. Uh, first of all, it was not announced, so the 11 black students I don't think got the message, but somehow we found out. So Vernon McLaurin, Lewis Smith, and myself, we went to the play that night. And once it was a very well acted play. The only thing was they used nigger so much in that play till it it somehow was not offensive from the stage, it was not offensive but you still felt it. But I was just amazed that none of us even got the invitation or the notice that it was there, but we did go. It was a very good play, just racist. It was presented to me in the most racist way they could present it. They had a, a play, John Brown's Body. The play was being put on either by, by one of the colleges, Mississippi State Ole Miss, one of them. I don't know which one it was, but it was, mandatory that every senior go to that play. 
they had us to sit in a special place. <laughs> you know, they wanted us all together. I said, Lord, if they throw a bomb, they got us all together. You had to go to the play. If you didn't attend the play, you wouldn't, you were automatically wouldn't pass. So, and it was the first night event. Their behavior, you know, making all of this sound, calling us all of these names and stuff. Now, I do give um, uh, whichever college it was because they wrote back to the school and told them that they would never, because of their behavior and the way that they acted, that they were very humiliated, that they were embarrassed and they were upset and they wouldn't, that they would have to apologize to them and everybody for their behavior. They never would come back to Provine again. Hazel Jordan and Verna McLaurin were shocked that even some of the black janitors and cooks at Provine ignored and mistreated them. The head janitor's name was Proctor. And I just won't forget him because he just basically asked me one day, what are you niggas doing over here? So the janitors, the cooks, the men says the cooks would give them more food on their plates, but it looked to me as if they didn't want to serve you when I go through the line. You know, as if they didn't want to serve you. If they did, they gave you the smallest portion that they could give you. If you passed the janitors or the, at that time they were called maids, in the uh, hallways, they wouldn't speak to you at all. I remember Proctor, him and some of the white boys were sitting around talking and I passed by and all of them started laughing. And I don't know whether he was talking about me, but it still hurt to see him siding with them, trying to hold on to their job. To me, the interaction that we got and the reason I feel like they were responding corresponds with slavery time where you had the house niggers and you had the field niggers. And the house niggers were like, well, Masa treats us well. And that's, the, the feeling you got when you were around the janitors and housekeepers or maids at John W. Provine that year was they were the house niggers and we were the field niggers so we, you don't need to go on about our business and do whatever we need to do and just not be there. Every day at the end of the day, I was like, thank God this day is over. However, I got up every day with the attitude, these white people don't want me here and I'm gonna be there just cause they don't want me here. And that was just my attitude, period. I said, it's gonna be a very rough year. I said, it's gonna be tough. I, I developed a headache during that, that year. I usually don't get headaches, but I, it was a stressful. And the first part of the, the, the year was very stressful. The middle part was less stressful cause you knew the pattern, how they, how they worked. and. And then the, uh, the last part was just not nearly as stressful as the first part. After being informed about Provine's 50th class reunion, Don Gibson, Hazel Jordan, and Vernon McLaurin decided to attend. Well, some of them at that at, at anniversary, they, they apologized for being ugly. And uh, it was okay. It was cordial. We were all older then. Everybody was old and... <laughs> well, one of the white classmates was Dr. Gibson's patients. And my understanding was that he told Dr. Gibson, well, I'm gonna be out of town this weekend, but did you know that Provine's reunion was this weekend? So Dr. Gibson contacted Vernon and I and asked us, would we attend? And I'm like, mm no. So we did attend, the three of us, Don Ava Gibson, Vernon McLaurin and myself, we did attend the morning prayer breakfast that was held at Piccadilly's in North Jackson on I-55. That was a very pleasant meeting. We had Christian classmates who were really interested in where we've gone in life, you know, what we've accomplished, our children, you know, just generally about our lives. Then they had a watermelon picnic at noon that the three of us decided not to attend. And the banquet was that night, that the three of us did attend that night. Well, at the banquet, the alcohol was served. And that's when the bubbles came out. 
some of the same people that harassed us and called us nigger back in 65, 66 were there. Let us know they didn't like us then, didn't like us now, didn't want us there then, didn't want us there now, where others were uh, interacting with us more apologetically that night. So I, I have a picture of it just I couldn't believe we did this because it was such a bad experience for me till I didn't ever want to have to interact with any of these people again. I was referred to Dr. Gibson by somebody in my family. And then probably at our first uh, meeting, we realized that we'd gone to high school together. We don't care anything about it, and uh, it doesn't mean anything to us. And the fact that we went to high school together has little or perhaps nothing to do with our friendship. But we have lots in common, and we discovered that early on, too. And uh, so it's just, been a wonderful experience. Don Gibson, not just as my doctor, but also as my good friend. Morris Lewis decided to attend Provine because he was a civil rights activist. He was bold, outgoing, and fearless. He was there the year they shot into the uh, Jackson State. The night the uh, highway patrol shot into the dormitory, girls' dormitory at Jackson State. Uh, my brother was there. I remember Morris Lewis had a GTO. He was the only one of us that had a car. And those white people really didn't like that. Morris was, as I say, he was ahead of his time. He did a lot of things in his life that uh, uh, was ahead. Uh, give an example, uh, even before we knew about cell phones, Morris had a cell phone. He was into real estate. He would buy a lot of houses, fix them up, and he had a way of predicting uh, things. For example, I wasn't here, but the flood of 79. Mars knew a flood was coming in, in South Jackson because it always flooded every so often, maybe every five to ten years. So he bought a fleet of houses on two sides of the street. He insured, fixed those houses up, bought them for little or nothing, he, and fixed the house, he fixed the houses up, insured them, and perhaps three or four years later, it did flood. Mars died about it's been about 16 years now, and uh, he had a massive heart attack. Before transferring to Provine, Roland was a star athlete at his previous high school, Jim Hill. Once he got to Provine, he wasn't allowed to play basketball, and his hoop dreams were put on hold. Candy was very bright in school. Um, he used to tell me all the time, I don't want everybody to know that uh, I'm a brainiac. I, I want him to think I'm just a regular guy. Roland was a basketball player, exceptional basketball player. Uh, Roland Dotson, he was really good at basketball. In fact, he played on the basketball team at Jim Hill. But when he transferred to Provine, he wasn't eligible to play that year. So that knocked him out of any chance of getting a scholarship for them to, to play basketball at Jackson State or somewhere, you know. Roland passed in July of 1995. He drowned, and he was over in Rankin County in an all-white neighborhood in a pond uh, because they knew him real well. And uh, he was with a young man he had taken over there from California. And by being in a white area, he didn't inform anybody that Roland was in the water. He drove all the way back to my grandmother's house to say that Roland had drowned. Everybody was out there and they were so stunned, you know, because they knew him and they were like, we know Roland. All you had to do was holler, yell. We'd have come, got him out, you know. And, uh, and the guy just couldn't believe it. Melba Sue Chambliss also transferred from Jim Hill to attend Provine her senior year. Her mother was actively involved in the civil rights movement, and she was inspired to follow in her footsteps to advocate for social justice and equality. This is where we grew up. Um, 
Melba was the first of four children of their marriage. Uh, my brother Kerry Jr. was next, then my brother Rudolph, and then me. Uh, I'm the youngest. She was always my boss. She was uh, always very intelligent. Uh, there were always a lot of people coming to visit the house, especially in the 60s that I can remember quite well uh, when she was a teenager. Um, they, uh, my mom would let her have parties here at the house. And uh, so people would come from all over Washington addition uh, uh, to right here. Uh, we were probably some of the first people in Washington addition to have color TV. And she was very much involved uh, in the civil rights movement and some of the marches and everything that were, uh, that were going on at the time. Uh, she didn't back down or back off of it. Um, um, I think she was glad to do it. Um, I think it was a hard experience for her. Uh, it probably affected her uh, later in life to be coming from a very loving and supportive environment to go into a very hateful uh, environment uh, where the uh, teachers didn't want you to succeed. And, uh, uh, but she was determined to and uh, we're very proud of it for what uh, she and the other students were able to accomplish. Chris Stevens also made the decision to transfer to Provine. He grew up in a family that was considered elite during that time, and he was well-liked among his friends. Chris and uh, uh, my brother would be together a lot, and they, uh, they met a lot of times at my house. They would study, or they'd be at the Chris house study. Chris went in the military, and some way, now my understanding, he was injured in the military. And when he came home, you know, he wasn't the same, let me put it like that, okay? He didn't go to no war or nothing, but he wasn't the same when he came home. His grandparents had died and left him the home house. I think he lost the home house and all. And he really, he had no family, let me put it like that. He had no wife, no children, nothing. And really, when Chris died, he, he, he didn't have anything. He could, didn't even have burial. So his classmates got together and buried him. To see the see him the way he died, as opposed to the way he lived, was real tragic and sad. I could remember. I remember Chris at the VA hospital, and I looked at Chris, and he looked like a street homeless person, and it hurt me to my heart. And he said, "Vernon, I said, Chris, what you done, man?" He he came over. He's a man. He people trying to kill me and they had him on some medicine some strong stuff and next thing I know they had moved Chris out into a home where he passed. When schools were forced to integrate there was a rapid increase of white students that left the public school system an action commonly referred to as white flight. The Supreme Court with this decision Alexander versus Holmes in 1969 that was Holmes County Mississippi is going to declare that all deliberate speed has to end, that desegregation has to come immediately. And when that happens in 1969, and schools are forced to desegregate in 1970 completely, 40% of the student body population in Jackson Public Schools leaves overnight. That's 10,000 white students are gone overnight. 60% of them are gonna end up in segregationist academies. Some of them Citizens Council schools. The Citizens Council, the largest private segregationist organization in the country, is gonna essentially operate its own school system in Mississippi. I had left teaching at Provine and teaching altogether by the time the massive desegregation occurred here in Jackson in the uh, December uh, January time period when schools were closed for the holidays uh, and so that in the January of 1970 massive desegregation occurred and massive white flight occurred from the public schools. Giants, they try to 
take over the land But we won't be moved by the monsters of man They gon' fall down, we gon' stand Hey, cause I see them fall I see them fall I see the change coming soon, dog. Man, I seen it all I seen it all Giants, they stand tall for a minute But I seen the goal I seen the goal Looking down on me like I'm finished But don't know the call They don't know the call I see the down car, sin afflicted Man, I see the small I see the small These giants, they wanna try hard to kill us But who playing ball? Man, who playing ball? I see them fall I see them fall Man, I see them fall Said I see them fall I see them fall I see them fall I see them fall you know, I can freely protest now without worrying about being attacked or the police arresting me to a certain extent. But just think about in the 60s, they were protesting during a time where they were getting arrested, being attacked by dogs, water hoses were being sprayed on them. So I just wanted to do my parents or do my dad, did his classmates realize how courageous they were being during that time. They almost like minimize racism. They talk about it like it's something that's just prehistoric, something that's in the past. It's just kind of hard to believe, especially since the 60s wasn't that long ago. Over 50 years have passed since the 11 teenagers walked through the doors of Provine High School in 1965. How much have we changed as a society since then? How much progress has really been made in regard to social justice and equality? My daddy was an engineer and um, my mother was a sales clerk after she went to work. Um, so they weren't, you know, well off, real well off people, but um, they, they knew what was right and they, they um, believed that people were people and that we should uh, be respectful. After Breonna Taylor, Amaya Aubrey and George Floyd were killed, you know, there were protests like all over the United States, even just worldwide. So I decided like I wanted to get more involved and be active. I'm, I didn't want to just, you know, post a hashtag and change my profile picture and not do anything. If you look at everything that's going on right now in 2020, it's almost like racism is almost, it's magnified. It may not be as blatant as it was in the 60s, but it's, it's more exposed. And it just makes you wonder, you know, how much progress have we really made in terms of um, social justice and racism? Roland paved the way for me to stand tall and be bold without being afraid to come home and talk to my grandmother. I started at Provine in 1972 as a ninth grader. It was a whole different environment for me. So I felt I had done Candy, Roland, Dotson proud because I exceeded and what they would not allow him to accomplish. In the end, uh, when Candy would refer to his education and the change, he appreciated being a part of the movement because he felt he had done something for his people. And he used to tell me and for me, you go over there and you excel. So this is my first year actually protesting. Here in Atlanta, a church organized a silent protest. I decided to just get some flyers, get some posters, and I went in the streets, and I actually protested downtown. We went through neighborhoods, across bridges, and I remember passing the apartment complex, and I looked up, and I saw two women who, and they looked like they were probably about my dad's age, and they were looking at us, and they were just so proud, and I could tell that they were thinking about what they went through during that time, and how now, like, the younger generation, like, we have to carry the torch, and it's almost, discouraging at the same time because it's like, you know, it's 2020 and wow, we're still fighting for equal rights. It's like, it's, a, it's the same battle. And I, I just wonder, you know, yeah, progress has been made, but it just makes you see that we still have a long way to go. Uh, I'll probably do it again. That, that, that year, it was rough, it was, it was tough. It was a tough year, but I, uh, if I knew what I knew now, and, and I probably would, I would uh, do it again. I think I really went there really to try to make a difference, to make a statement that, hey, they're no better than I am. And I ain't going to say I regret going there, but if I had to do it again, I probably wouldn't do it. I would do it again. I was so proud to be one of those first 11. It was not that I was trying to make history. It was, I just wanted to do this for my people. My daughter, my baby daughter, youngest daughter, 
attended Provine years later because of the impact that it made that her mother and father had attended Provine and were among the first 11 and her pictures on the wall. So yes, I would do it again. So would I. <laughs> we could do whatever anybody else could do, but we couldn't get your knee off our neck. What happened to Floyd happens every day in this country, in education, in health services, and in every area of American life. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and say, get your knee off our necks.